Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be opening this session. Um, it's going to take place, most of it, in English, as we have um, an addition I'll talk about in a moment. But at the beginning, I will warn the English speakers. Amos will be speaking um, in honor of Colonel Moreno in a moment in Hebrew, so there will be a little bit at the beginning. Um, this session, we are going to be talking about challenges as we look into the future. And for this session, we're going to be broadening out from the specific Israeli arena. And we've brought on board a uh, foremost Israeli um, um, a person to be able to talk about it and um, a US one. So the speakers in this um, session are going to be um, what you can see here as they're seated already, Major General uh, Amos Gilad. Um, spoken before about um, um, Avi Dichter. He served as the Director of Policy and Political Military Affairs at the Ministry of Defense, um, but really during his 30 years of service at the IDF, um, Amos has been, among other positions, the Head of the Military Intelligence Research Division, the IDF spokesperson, the Coordinator of Government Activities in the Territories, and the Military Secretary of Prime Minister and Defense Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Um, today, um, Amos is a lecturer and researcher at the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy at IDC. Um, in addition, today we have from the United States joining us um, Honorable Joel Rayburn, who today is serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Levant Affairs. And for the session itself, I'm going to focus on the fact as Special Envoy for Syria. Um, he previously served in the administration um, as a senior director for Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon at the National Security Council. Um, and the two of them are going to be talking a bit as we go on about the threats of where we are right now. I'm going to ask uh, Amos to please, Mr. Gilad, to come up here, please, and give a, little, a, few, a few words about Colonel Moreno in honor of the session itself. And after that, we'll, we'll start discussing the issues. Amos, please. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, בוקר טוב, זה כבוד גדול לדבר על סגן אלוף מורנו ז"ל שהוא מופת לגבורה, לאומץ לב, למסירות למדינה. הדברים האלה הפכו למיתוס והם ידועים. אני רוצה להקדיש את הדברים שלי לצד הלא ידוע. עד היום התמונה שלו אסורה בפרסום. כשממשלה או ראש ממשלה או שר הביטחון או הרמטכ"ל מקבלים החלטה כמובן רגישה בנושא ביטחון, הם צריכים לדעת במה מדובר, מה תמונת האויב. על בסיס תמונת המודיעין הם עושים הערכת מצב ומחליטים אם לעשות או לא לעשות. אני לא מגזים בכלל אם אומר שסגן אלוף מורנו שייך לקבוצה מאוד מצומצמת, או אם אני אשתמש בפסוק הידוע, מעולם לא היו חייבים כל כך מעטים, כל כך הרבה. כל כך מעט, קבוצה מצומצמת של אנשים שאפשרה לממשלה להבין מה קורה כל הזמן, 24-7, כדי לקבל את ההחלטות הנכונות. זה מחייב אומץ לב, לצערי אי אפשר להיכנס לפרטים, יש פה כמה מהאנשים החשובים ביותר בקהילת המודיעין שמבינים מה אני מדבר, אבל אני כן רוצה לשתף אתכם שאילולא אנשים כל כך אמיצים, כמו סגן אלוף מורנו ז"ל. Great people like Lieutenant Colonel Moreno of blessed memory, our country would be like a blind man in a chimney, and the decisions would be accordingly. So I'm talking about big security decisions made, big security successes that are, were rooted in the ability to intimately understand what is happening beyond enemy lines. And Moreno is really the prototype, the model the role model that very few are like that made it all happen and not only that he was of course ex exemplary in terms of his dedication and in terms of his courage and that's why he really is a national hero I've been asked to speak about him here and I see that as a great privilege and I really mean it I'm not just trying to be polite he is the kind of people who I absolutely adore admire honor appreciate if it weren't for people like him, we would certainly have made errors that would have brought us great turmoil. So I stand here saluting him on behalf of us all and thank you for the privilege, the ICT's privilege uh, given to me to say, you know, just a little bit of what I can say because if I could talk to him about him for 25 hours, I'd be able to do that effortlessly because he made such a unique contribution in those areas that will never be known, just like his picture, that two 
date can still not be published. So thank you. Thank you so much to Amos Gilad for speaking about Colonel Moreno, really somebody who is, for all of us, such an important figure. We're going to open up this session right now. I'll remind you all it's September 9th, and I'm going to talk about a few buzzwords before I ask the question. Are we talking this morning about drones? Ah, that was in the last 24 hours. Rockets? Oh, that's been pretty much in the last hour. Perhaps tunnels, weapon convoys. Are we talking about Syria, Hezbollah, Iran, about the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, Shiite militias, strongmen, Kurds? Are we going to zoom out? Do we need to talk about Russia in the arena, Turkey in the arena? And I put that all out there as the opening session to be able to talk about it from both the US and Israel perspective and policy. And I hope to do so with these two gentlemen right now. So, Mr. Rayburn, I'm going to address you in Israeli fashion as Joel. We just met, but you know we're in Israel. We do things informally. And what I'd like to hear from you at the beginning is to try to describe the U.S. policy towards the Syrian arena from your position as the special envoy for Syria in the United States right now. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start by... Uh uh, thanking Dr. Knorr and the IDC for, for the invitation. Uh, Boaz probably doesn't remember, but I met him when he used to come to West Point when I was on the faculty there as a major. In the months and couple of years right after 9-11, when on the U.S. side, uh, we were casting about for expertise to help us understand, to find the problem uh, of terrorism that we were dealing with, something that we hadn't expected. And, uh, and Boaz's advice was invaluable, and it still is. So thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, in, my, uh, in my role as uh, the US Special Envoy for Syria, I'd like to describe today the way uh, the team inside the US government that works on Syria defines at least uh, the major part of the problem that we're dealing with in Syria. Uh, President Trump, earlier this year, gave us some very clear marching orders within the U.S. government that we were to pursue three uh, uh, interlocking, I'll say, goals in Syria for U.S. interests. The first was to complete the campaign against Daesh, uh, having seen the end of the territorial caliphate, then, in other words, for us to undertake the activities necessary to make sure that Daesh can't return. And having been through a similar movie uh, several times in Iraq next door where we have a military victory over uh, a, a militant group that's trying to hold territory, then when we take the territory, uh, we know that if we don't do what comes next and actually solve the underlying uh, factors that led to the rise of that militant group, then we're, we're probably going to be back doing the same thing over and over again. So the president wanted us to avoid that outcome in Syria. Second, the president instructed us to seek the complete withdrawal from Syria of all Iranian commanded forces, including but not limited to Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, and this is something, of course, that's become more and more uh, uh, important over the last couple of years, seem seemingly with every passing week. And third, the president directed us to seek a political resolution to the Syrian conflict in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. So inside the US government, we think that both the Daesh problem and the, uh, the Iranian regime military problem in Syria are symptoms of the overall conflict. They're not the cause of the conflict. So if we are, are the thrust of our strategy is that if we are to solve problems number one, dash, number two, the Iranian regime in Syria, that we have sustainably, so that we don't keep dealing with them generation after generation, then we have to, three, get the resolution to the, to the underlying conflict. And that's why we work so hard uh, in, the, uh, in the peace process, the political process, uh, in concert with, uh, with the, the UN. What I would note is that, let, the, let me track a little bit of the development of uh, uh, the way we see the situation in Syria. In spring 2017, it became apparent to us that the IRGC Quds Force and Qasem Soleimani had shifted the main effort for themselves in Syria from participation in the Syrian civil war on the side of Bashar al-Assad to the establishment of their strategic ground line of communications connecting Iran to southwestern Syria and the Beka Valley 
and establishing Iranian regime power projection platforms within Syria that could be used to threaten Syria's neighbors. First and foremost, Israel. A little closer? Okay, sorry. Uh, in other words, uh, that having reached, uh, having, having gone as far as the Iranians felt was in their interest in, uh, uh, in retaking territory on behalf of Bashar al-Assad, they decided uh, to take territory on behalf of themselves and to establish those, those, it, uh, a, a new threat uh, to Syria's regional neighbors using missile outposts, armed drones, and, and establishing bases for uh, IRGC Quds Force militant proxies. And we've seen that happen more over, they've, this has intensified over the last two and a half years. This amounts to an unprecedented Iranian regime invasion, military invasion of the Arab world. And we think it's the single most destabilizing factor in the conflicts that span the northern Middle East right now. And it is the most, it, it is the, the factor that creates the most risk that the Syrian conflict could explode into a regional or an international conflict. And, and for those of us in the U.S. government who work on Syria, this has something of a feel of the summer of 1914 to it. That the Iranians, uh, in, in, a, in a way that I think those of us who study them believe uh, is more reckless than we ever thought they could be, Qasem Soleimani in particular, are playing with fire in a situation where the world's superpowers are on the scene. Israel is on the scene. Turkey is on the scene. So they, are, they, they continue week after week. It's rare that a week goes by without an incident that couldn't escalate into a regional or even international conflict. And it's, it's a, uh, this is deliberate provocation by the Iranian regime through Qasem Soleimani. We now have a situation, so uh, I'll, I'll wrap up, where it appears that it is Assad regime policy to enable this expansion for, for whatever reasons the Assad regime has, to enable this expansion of uh, IRGC power projection into Syria to be used against Syria's neighbors. And the Russians also risk the perception that they are extending air defense cover to this extension of IRGC power projection into Syria. Uh, it appears to, our, to some of us uh, that the Iranian regime has decided to try to create a, a North Korea versus Seoul type of existential threat to its regional adversaries. In other words, to establish multiple uh, missile threats and armed UAV threats as well as additional ground threats that, that, the, that move the red lines throughout the region and can existentially blackmail uh, uh, the Iranian regime's rival uh, uh, adversary capitals. So that's, the, that's Israel, that's Saudi Arabia, that's the UAE in particular. And this is, the, this is the problem as we would define it right now. I think that that was one of the most interesting, very clear descriptions of a threat. In a moment, I'm going to ask you afterwards also about the response and the policy, because I'm not sure that in that stage I'm going to see the U.S. response in that sense to that aspect. Because here I want to hand over Israel and that area that we call Syria, let alone Syria, Lebanon. In Israel, we tend to call the threat the northern threat, as opposed to just the Iranian threat. And I'd love almost for you to expand as you see this threat. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of things that you agree with Mr. Rayburn, but I'm also interested in the places where you think that perhaps there are differences between the U.S. view of the threat and that Iranian central aspect of it and between the way we see it in Israel. Uh, thank you. Let's begin by thanking the United States. I've served decades in, uh, in the Army and the Minister of Defense, and uh, I do have deep appreciation to the friendship, unique friendship between the United States of America and Israel. I'm considering U.S.-Israel friendship as a major pillar in our national security, and I would like to salute you. <laughs> However, like the British judges uh, used to say, um, I would like to share with you some concerns I do have in my mind. The Iranian threat is the worst one. Iran used to be our best friend, Iran. is determined to destroy Israel. It sounds like propag political propaganda, but it's true. And they are implementing their vision. And they do have, I think, 
brilliant plan. The first <coughs> pillar is Lebanon, so-called Lebanon, sovereign country, member of the United Nations, that has become Hezbollah. The whole area between Beirut and our border has become Hezbollah. Hezbollah means it's a dependent entity at the expense of sovereign Lebanon. For example, if Hezbollah attacks Israel, and by this attack, Lebanon will be at, uh, exposed to retaliation, the only one that takes decision is Nasrallah or General Qasem Soleimani. And Lebanon does have president, and he's the supreme commander of the armed forces of Lebanon. He will hear of the Hezbollah attack on Israel from the TV. And they do have ambitious plan to build in Lebanon some layers of capabilities against Israel. Rockets, 150,000 rockets aimed to all parts of Israel against the population, not against the IDF. Second layer, missiles. The missiles are accurate, unlike rockets, and armed UAVs, drones, and so on and so on. That's the first part. The second part is Syria, another weak state that the Iranians are using it in order to build second front against Israel, to build like siege on Israel. It's one belt without one road uh, to Israel, if I use the Chinese policy. Siege on Israel. And they are going to do the same in Iraq, very weak state, and to use the Western, huge area of Western Iraq against Israel, and Iran itself with the missiles, and at the top of it, the nuclear program. Now, with all due respect to our friends in Washington, I am very worried today. Why? Because I don't understand in, in Middle East, words are not enough. If President Trump, with all due respect, is ready to meet President uh, Rouhani, I think he is the best or the worst cheater in the world. He can sell you everything and you believe him. And he has described Iran under dramatic change. We change. They are threatening us with rockets, with missiles, with terror, with nuclear. And he is ready to meet with him. To do what? To have agreement. Which agreement he can achieve, United States, with, with Iran? The only agreement they can achieve is very similar to the agreement that all of us hate. Namely, delay the timetable of nuclear program, not to give it up. It will not include, I can show you, missiles, rockets, ballistic capabilities, drones, and the continuous effort to build Iran around us. So I must share with you, this is my opportunity, to share with you our deep concern. And if, if it happens, I'm worried about the example of North Korea, because North Korea means he will not give up his vicious regime and the nuclear included, and it might repeat itself. It will, it, it does the last sentence. It does have the potential of undermining the whole structure of United States supremacy in the Middle East because the Arabs will not trust the United States. And for Israel, even our prime minister said, I'm not going to consult or, give, or give, share with the president my opinion about with whom he needs to meet. If President Obama did it, he would share with us his opinion. I'm very worried about it, and in this ICT, uh, I, I need to share with you my deep concern. So I think that that's a fascinating way to open up, in that sense, a discussion here, to present it. And I don't want to put you on the spot, Joel, because at the end you are in an official position. And right now, Amos has the distinct advantage that he can say what perhaps in the past would have been more difficult when he was in an official position. But look if at what just came up. I was in I would say the opposite. That's okay. That's part of the fun of being outside the official positions. Because think about it for a moment. You presented here three main goals. Anti-Daesh, the withdrawal of the Iranians in that sense, and a political resolution. You at least did not mention the nuclear issue. And Amos stands up and says, Iran, 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 and puts those three different levels of the different arenas. And I'm going to hand it back and say, yes, special envoy to Syria to try and address Syria. Obviously, Iran is in the room. How do you bring those things together when you're talking about U.S. policy? Uh, thank you. Uh, um, and I'll speak my mind, even hey, as an official. Even better. Uh, the, so to your mouth. The, uh, Different aspects of the, of, of the Iran problem. 
Uh, I the U.S. team is pretty clear-eyed about the nature of, of the Iranian threat. And so our guidebook on this is the 12 points that Secretary Pompeo laid out in 2018 about the conditions the Iranian regime would have to meet in order to come to an agreement uh, that the U.S. would find acceptable. So the nuclear issue is uh, a very prominent one on that list. It's not the only one. Uh, state sponsorship of terrorism, uh, missile proliferation, and the thing that the, the thing that came straight to our team, uh, myself and Ambassador James Jeffrey, who was who was uh, uh, who was with me on the Syria team, was the aspect that I mentioned that uh, the U.S. seeks the complete withdrawal of all Iranian regime commanded forces from all of Syria. So I'm, I'm going to jump in for a moment because yeah, okay. I wanted to keep on talking. This is with you. Um, the position that you're in right now as special envoy to Syria is essentially there is no U.S. ambassador to Syria, right? right. So you're not there. So right. tell us how you go about things like that when the United States is not there. I mean, at the end, there are other countries that are there. Russia is there. Iran is there. How do you enact these kind of things when you are not there? Okay, so, so Secretary Pompeo's 12 points signal to the Iranian regime that if at the end of the day uh, it wants to get out from under maximum pressure, that one of the things it's going to have to do is get out of Syria. So the, our Syria policy and our Iran policy, our strategies for both, are inextricably linked. We also see them coming together, for example, and right now uh, the U.S. team has the goal of driving Iranian oil exports to zero. One of the most important channels for Iranian oil exports right now, as we've famously seen in the last couple of weeks, is Iranian regime oil exports to the Assad regime which enables the Assad regime to keep the killing machine going and also generates cash, as, as we've been told, uh, that Qasem Soleimani can then use to keep Hezbollah going, keep Hamas going, keep Islamic Jihad going, and, and so on. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pernicious circle. So that's, that's the way in which, th these are just the, some of the main ways in which our Syria strategy and our, our Iran policy are connected. The things, we're not on the ground in a lot of Syria, we're in some of Syria, and, and so by being in the Daesh campaign in northeast Syria, for example, we deny some strategic resources, we deny some terrain, just as a matter of course, not as a matter of a military mission, but the fact that we're there, we deny the Assad regime and the Iranian regime access to that territory, which we, they would dearly love to have. So the rest of our, uh, the rest of our tools tend to, are from the outside in, mostly. This is political pressure, isolate the Assad regime, particularly on the question of its enabling of the Iranian regime's power projection, and secondly, economic pressure against the Assad regime and its allies to show them again it's a it's a it's a quasi maximum pressure campaign against the Assad regime for it to alter its behavior, such as prosecuting the war against its own people and enabling the Iranian regime to project power. So you've gone around in that sense, and as I'm listening to him, almost I'm thinking to myself with great appreciation of the United States of America and of that very special relationship that we have. Amos, we're not the 51st state. We're Israel. When we look, you focused very strongly on Iran as the threat. Can you share with us perhaps some of the potential, perhaps that there is, of looking at it and also seeing something not optimistic, I would never say that kind of word here, but potential for new alliances in the Middle East because of the threats that you're talking about right now, things that could change within the Middle East? Before that, I would like to begin again with a deep appreciation to U.S. That's why I'm so concerned. Because previously, Does we used to divide point? our jobs. The yeah, United States has dealt with the Soviet, ex, late Soviet Union or Russia today. And today we are like alone. We need coordination with the Russians in order to be able, allegedly, to attack the Iranian infrastructure. The United States has declared war very successfully, it ended, against Daesh. We are the only ones who are attacking uh, Iranian forces and Hezbollah in Lebanon, in Syria, and allegedly in other parts of the Middle East. I need to be very cautious because everything is allegedly. So maybe what I'm saying is not true. Let's assume it's true. We are the only ones. With all due respect to Israel, some of us think that we are global superpower. I would like to share with you a secret. We are not. We are regional power. Regional power 
and the IDF has very impressive capabilities. However, it's only Israel. And the United States is not translating the 12 principles of Pompeo. That's why I'm so concerned about the potential meeting between Rouhani and President of the United States where? In New York. I'm recommending you to be concerned as well. And the way I see it, today they have tried the Iranians to launch rockets or whatever against Israel. They have tried it before. You don't hear about it because it fails all the time. However, I feel we are alone. Now, Iran embodies strategic threat to the whole Middle East. They are attacking Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, the Arabs are not doing their best to attack back. However, they are frightened to death from Iran. And we do have, we are lucky after long efforts to have unique security, defense, and other areas of cooperation with the Arab countries. It's a dream. That's not the topic, so that's why I'm not going to talk about it. For Israel, it's strategic asset. However, it's very difficult to me, to be very polite, to imagine the Arabs attacking Iran in Iran in spite of the fact that for Iran, Saudi Arabia, under this regime, must disappear. So it means, and I hope I'm wrong about the whole analysis, we are more and more alone. And that's not recommended to our national health because in the horizon, what I can foresee, that our conflict with the Iranians will be bigger and deeper. And, and, if Iran feels, that's the last sentence, if Iran feels that there is no real threat to Iran, because President Trump has said, I'm not going to use a military option, in spite of the fact that the, the might of the US Air Force or the armed forces of the United States is unbelievable. It means they feel immune and they will continue. They will continue to invest huge resources in spite of the fact that they are suffering from economic difficulties in Iran. So we are dealing with ideological, religious, enemy, and I feel we are more and more alone in spite of the fact that there is no substitute to our unique cooperation, intel operation, and so on with the United States, our main friend and major pillar in our national security. Joel, I'd love to hear in a sense how you respond when you talk about that aspect, both of the U.S.-Israel and the differences that we look at this, because um, I think for each one of us here, Amos, you've been a leader, certainly in Israel, and I would go so far as to say for the last 25, if not 30 years, highlighting the Iranian threat. And I think that the United States has gone through very big differences in the way that they view the Iranian threat, because I want us to end at a zoom out for a moment. The United States is a world power. There's this other country called Russia. There's this relationship with you in Turkey. We're not, we're a regional power. So I'd like you to do a little bit of a zoom out and try and address it in a sense, as both Amos spoke about it together, how we feel alone and how the United States steps in on this issue. Well, I, I, I want to assure you that there is virtually no daylight in the way that the United States sees the problem and the way that we know that our Israeli allies see the problem. And acts on it? So, uh, you can see, President. first of all, uh, President Trump has shown uh, in some major ways that he will take the decision to use U.S. military force to protect U.S. interests and those of our allies when he deems it appropriate to respond to the threat. That, for example, uh, he's done uh, consistently against, against Daesh and other terrorist threats. Uh, and he's, he's done even, he's the first U.S. president uh, to use military forces against the Assad regime, for example. So he, he is willing to use military force when he deems it appropriate. And I believe that the U.S. administration and our Israeli allies share strategic goals in Syria. And this is, why we, this is one of the reasons why I'm here. Uh, I didn't just come to the, of course I came at the invitation of Boaz, but, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm here and our, our teams are continually here to coordinate very closely with our Israeli counterparts. Uh, it's why we meet in a trilateral format and so on. And, and we have, uh, we, we've made it very clear and we'll continue to do so at every opportunity that, uh, that we share Israel's assessment of the threat against Israel as well as against U.S. interests and that we support fully Israel's right to defend itself against that threat. 
and we're not going to do anything to slow down uh, uh, Israel's uh, uh, freedom to act against the threat to, pr to protect itself. Uh, I'm gonna and, and this is a, this is a message that we make clear to everyone in this in this arena, including to uh, including to our Russian friends. And when we sit down at the ta across from the table with our Russian friends to talk about Syria or elsewhere in the region, one of the very first things that's discussed is to clarify again that both we and Russia uh, must agree that Israel's right to defend itself has to be protected. Almost, I'm going to let you say at the end here also in a sense of what makes you scared and what makes you hopeful? I'm <clears throat> You're known as the prophet of doom, so the scared part perhaps is more, more well known. Because of the time, uh, you know, what is optimistic in Middle East is uh, experienced pessimistic. Uh, look, with the Russians, for example, there is one of the conditions is to remove Assad. Assad, by the way, it's very important to this uh, conference, was born in 9-11. Yes? I'm not sure you know about it. He is, uh, he's cutting cake every 9-11. This is mega psycho terrorist. The feasibility, he will step down without being killed. In, in Syria, you, the Alawites step down. Either they get killed. Somebody kills them, they are killed or they are poisoned, or they have invented something creative in the world. General Canaan has committed suicide with three bullets. Only in Syria, by the way. <laughs> so if, if there is any illusion that Assad will step down, he will not. The Russians will not allow it. Uh, and he will continue, he will build uh, army, armed forces, and the presence of Syria under the auspice of Russia. I don't have time to, to elaborate it. I'm optimistic that this problem will continue. I'm not optimistic we won't be alone. Thank How's you. And I would like again that? to thank you, my dear friend, about the whole cooperation. There is no alternative. It's not contradictory to what I've said, because our cooperation uh, with the United States, I'm talking about security, Intel, and so on, is wide and qualitative, unprecedented. Thank you. I've Thank the, I want to thank both of our panelists today for giving us the opportunity to hear a bit, both of the U.S. policy of the Israeli position, to see both the differences and where we come together. I'm going to repeat in that sense both what Amos said. I think that the Israeli-U.S. relationship is one of the things that strengthens the fact that this conference is dedicated to 9-11 in that date. So today from September now, we're going to end this session here um, in pessimistic optimism and hope that um, as we go on during the next next few days, we'll be able to learn more about these issues. Thank you, gentlemen, both very, very much. And I hand it back on and over to our masters. <laughs>